Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Living Traditions Homestead. Today is a day that I wait for all summer. Our very first tomato harvest. And it's not just going to be one tomato. There are several tomatoes that are ready to be picked. We looked out there last night. Like, all of a sudden, there's a bunch. And nice. Nice big tomatoes. Yeah, there's one cluster of tomatoes that we've been showing you in a lot of our videos and several of them in that cluster are ripe and they're gigantic. We're so excited. We put in over a hundred tomato plants this year so it's going to be a great year. And our plants are looking fantastic. And we've gotten a lot of questions from you guys about what it is that we are doing that makes them look so fantastic. So today we're gonna to talk with you about bug control and fertilizer. But first we need to go let all the animals out. Let's go say good morning to everybody. Good morning chickens. These young turkeys are growing so fast. They're the baby turkeys that we hatched in the incubator in the house. They've transitioned out to this big pen area for them and they're just doing great. Good morning baby chickens. Soon these chickens will be joining our laying flock and have free range of the entire property. But they need to get just a little bit older because of our roosters. We need to make sure these guys can handle all the attention they're gonna get from the roosters. Good morning, pig. Are you guys hungry this morning? I guess that's a yes. Can you believe how good these guys are looking? We are loving these Idaho pasture pigs. I hear Charlie calling for his breakfast. Let's go give it to him. Good morning, Charlie. What a nice big guy. Not too much longer he's going to get to go visit the girls. How are the best looking pigs in the world? Two duck eggs this morning. Let's go see if we can find Hope. I think I saw her over by the pond. Well, Hope sure is enjoying having all of this extra room. 
She's got this entire big pasture out here uh, all to herself right now. We still have a couple months before she's gonna have her baby, but she is looking good and she is enjoying life here on the farm. Now that we're finished with the animals, let's head to the garden. I can't wait for you guys to see these tomatoes. We've got a lot of them to pick. Now when we pick tomatoes, we always like to put them in these produce boxes. You usually get these from fr for free from one of your local grocery stores. Uh, but instead of putting them in like a basket like we pick our cucumbers and things into, we like to put them in here so we can keep them in a single layer. Tomatoes will bruise so easily, so you'll keep them a lot better if you put them in a single layer in one of these produce boxes. Let me show you that big cluster of tomatoes that Sarah was talking about, but that's just the beginning. You guys, look at these. Look how amazing those are. I'm gonna pick this one right here. Now that is a tomato. Look at that. This is why we like the Jetstar tomatoes because they just produce so well. And that is a, that's, to me, that's a perfect size tomato. Now, this first round will be, you know, we'll get a lot of them this size. As the summer goes on, they'll get a little bit smaller, but these jet stars just always produce beautiful tomatoes for us, which is why we've planted an entire row of them again this year. But now, another trick is when you pick these, pick the stem completely off, and that way when you're laying them in your box, you can lay them top side down. They'll stay better in your box. Now, we're gonna pick these today uh, all of them at this orange stage, a couple reasons. One, they'll continue to ripen in the house and by getting them out of the garden, we know that they're gonna be safe. They're not gonna get any attacked by any birds or bugs or anything at the last minute and ruin our beautiful tomatoes. The other thing is, honest, honestly, I like to eat them fresh at this stage when they're orange better than when they're really, really ripe. So they'll ripen in the house the rest of the way because I know Sarah likes them really ripe for making sauces. But for eating, I think this is perfect. Let's get picking. Wow, they're so gorgeous, look at that. This cluster has three of them ready and they're such a beautiful size. Wow. Wow, I can barely even believe it. I cannot believe what beautiful, perfect tomatoes these are. And so many of them are ripe at one time for this first harvest. So these tomatoes here are just from the Jet Star row. We did one side and then went to the other side and harvested. And this is a fantastic first harvest of tomatoes. And they are just beautiful. I think we have a tie for size. There are two that are just like mammoth size tomatoes. Fantastic. Let me see how many tomatoes we can get from the other kinds of tomatoes. And we'll show you in the end which is the best producer so far. Look 
Can you believe these gorgeous tomatoes? Look at this. Now the ones over on this side are all of the Jet Stars, our absolute favorite tomato. They totally won. Yeah, absolutely. And then these over here are the Jet Setters, which are very similar to the Jet Stars. And then these kind of goofy looking ones here. These are opulcas. Now there are only two of them, uh, but opulca is more of a sauce tomato. They're not as juicy on the inside. We're growing a bunch of these paste tomatoes to help make sauce easier. But overall, the Jet Stars totally won for the earliest harvest. Yeah. We've, this is the second year now that we've tried these Jet Setters as well, and they are gorgeous tomatoes. They're supposed to be an earlier producing tomato than the Jet Star, but this is the second year we've grown them, and this is the second time that the Jet Stars have actually produced earlier. So uh, I'm not sure if I buy that they're supposed to be an earlier producer, although they are a gorgeous tomato as well. And those plants are loaded also. The right. Jet Setters are loaded. So I don't want to say we're never going to grow those again just because they're not as early as the Jet Stars. They're doing really well. Yeah. So overall, this is a very good first harvest. Now this is just the tip of the iceberg Absolutely. as far as tomatoes go. Uh, once they start, we'll be picking these probably every other day or so. And Sarah will be canning pr pretty much every day. Now we also wanted to show you that we're just getting a bumper crop of cucumbers this year, thankfully, because last year was a total bust with cucumbers. Just have lots of them coming in. I'm, I'm making pickles, I'm making relish, and we're eating a bunch of them. We're also sharing with family and friends but the okra are starting to not yeah. really heavy, but no, they're not starting. a lot yet, but we're starting to get some enough to have a snack every day. I absolutely love okra. I love it fresh, steamed, fried, you name it. I love it with okra. We've already had one round of fried okra, which is another thing that the family looks forward to every year. But before we move on to sharing all of our secrets about how we keep our garden so healthy, I want to go inside and grab a knife so that we can cut into one of these gorgeous Jetstar tomatoes because I just want you to see how beautiful they are on the inside. Look at that. That is a perfect tomato. That is why we grow these Jetstars every year. We get so many questions about why they're our favorite. That right there is why they're our favorite. But, hey, you know me, I always have a salt shaker with me when we're outside working, so. It may look beautiful, but if it doesn't taste good, it's not a good tomato. But of course it tastes good too, so. Win-win. Now I get a snack, and you guys get to see these beautiful tomatoes. Okay guys, so let's move on to how we keep our garden looking so healthy and bug free and very productive. There are a few tricks that we have learned over the years that have been working more and more each year as we figure out what's best for us to do. So we are gonna share some of our secrets today. Now, everything might not work for you, but this is what's been working for us. Right, it also depends what pests you have in your area and you know your soil conditions and everything else. So again, this is what we do. Uh, use it as kind of a guideline and then apply it to your situation. So let's talk about first fertilizer. Right. Now there's one thing that we did this year that we had never done before, and we think it's really paying off with our big garden. Right. Now a lot of people I think have the idea that uh, if you're gonna grow an organic garden, your only real option uh, for fertilizer is to use manure or something like that. But there are other organic options uh, that you can use as well that for a long time we didn't use, but we started this year. One thing that we've realized is that we're starting to grow on a scale where using just manure as a fertilizer or compost just isn't possible. Uh, we've got two pretty large gardens. They're 50 feet by about 75 feet. We have two of them. And it, we can't even produce enough compost and we can't produce enough manure on our homestead to fertilize both of those spots effectively. So this year we looked into some organic fertilizer options. Right. Now a lot of it that we found online was super expensive uh, and then by the time you pay to ship it, it's also very expensive because you have to buy quite a bit. 
So what we actually ended up going with is just a brand from Walmart. Uh, it's called Expert Gardener. Now, none, nothing that we're showing you today are we affiliated with in right. any way. This is just what we're using and right. what we were able to find locally. So uh, you may have other brands by you, but you know you may find something similar. So this is called Expert Gardener Organics, and it's just an all-purpose uh, fertilizer. Yeah, it's like you know, like fertilizer grain. They have this all-purpose vegetable fertilizer, and they also have a tomato-specific fertilizer. But on both of our gardens, the one that has you know a bunch of different uh, vegetables growing in it, but also the watermelon and corn garden, before we planted, we tilled up the soil spread this out with a little, you know, spreader and then tilled it back in right. to prepare it, that soil for planting. And it comes in bigger bags than this. I think it was 20 pound bags that we bought. Right. Uh, but this, they also sell these small ones. And this is what we've been using in our containers that we're growing in this year as well. Right, so this we think has made a, a really great difference in our gardens this year. It's the first time we've used it and we feel like it was a success. Over the years, you guys have heard us talk about rabbit manure and we are still using rabbit manure. We normally use it when we are planting transplants. We dig the hole and we put a handful of rabbit manure down in the hole before we put the plant in there and cover it up. Sometimes we also top dress with rabbit manure after we put a transplant in there too. It just makes a huge difference. I think that is why our tomato plants and our pepper plants are so tall. The rabbit manure really is a great thing to add and it's really kind of a slow release. It kind of breaks down over time and continues to feed your plants uh, through a good part of the summer. And it's real easy to go back and put more just on top uh, throughout the summer if you want to. Now there are two other things that we've been using also and they are foliar feeds. What you do is you mix it up, it's a, it's a liquid, and you put it in your spray tank and you spray, on, spray it on all of the leaves of your plants and the plants are able to take that up into the plant and it helps them. There are two different kinds that we've been using. The first one is uh, fish emulsion. Now this fish emulsion has been with us for a long time and it doesn't have the um, label on it anymore, but you can really use any type of fish emulsion. This you use four tablespoons per gallon all the way down to one tablespoon per gallon depending on how you feel your plants need. Um, I actually use one tablespoon per gallon on transplants. It's you know gentle enough for the baby plants but you can do it all the way up to four tablespoons per gallon. And you want to spray this in the evening or sometime when when the plants aren't super hot so that the leaves don't get burned when, you know, just because you're spraying liquid right on the leaves. So don't do it during the hottest part of the day. Uh, either do it real early in the morning or do it in the evening so it has time to soak in overnight. Yeah, but it, in general, fish emulsion is very gentle for your plants. Uh, you just wanna make sure that any hot sunny time of day, you don't wanna be spraying them with any water. So the other thing we've been using as a foliar feed is Epsom salt. Now Epsom salt has a lot of minerals, specifically magnesium, that really kind of perks up the plants and it just allows them to grow better. Uh, you would mix this one tablespoon per gallon the same way you would the fish emulsion. Spray it as a foliar feed. It's very good, especially for your tomatoes and your pepper plants. So these are really all of the products that we use for fertilizing our garden. Now, uh, again, I think there's kind of a misconception sometimes that, you know, you can just put your seeds in the ground and then you just magically wait until it's time to harvest and everything just, you know, takes care of itself. But you can see that we do things along the way to help provide the best possible life for those plants and to make sure that they grow nice and strong. And none of the products that we use, you know, have any harsh chemicals. They're all organic options. So uh, it's really, it's something that you can do. You feel good about doing because you know you're gonna still provide good food for your family. Now, as far as the fertilizing schedule goes, again, uh, the granular stuff we till in at the beginning of the season before we even put down the woven ground cover. Then we add the rabbit manure uh, to the hole when we're planting our transplants and a little bit on top. And then the foliar feeds we do about every other week. We kind of rotate which ones we're doing. Uh, and just, you don't, but the main thing is to keep an eye on your plants and you'll be able to tell when they need a little boost. So let's move on to bug control. In Southern Missouri, there are a lot of bugs. Right. I never thought there'd be so many bugs, but there are tons of bugs. Yeah, we got kind of spoiled when we lived in Phoenix because there's not a whole lot of bugs there. I guess they don't like the desert, but here in Missouri, 
It's been a rude awakening for us over the last four years, but we've learned a few things and we think we finally have a pretty good regimen of how to keep them under control. The first thing that we want to talk to you about as far as bug control is something that's kind of a general spray that we use in the garden. We use for a lot of different things and that is neem oil. Now you can buy neem oil that's already packaged for spraying on your plants and it comes all mixed up and you can just basically start spraying it on. Uh, but what we found is that a lot of times those have a very low concentration of neem oil uh, and they're just not real effective. So what we do is we buy neem oil in bulk on Amazon. I think we bought like a gallon of it a couple years ago. We still have it and we just put it in separate little jars like this so we can keep it on a shelf in the house. You want to keep it out of the light. You don't want it you know, to be in the garage where it's real hot or something like that. So and we just keep this on the shelf and then every summer we have it to use. We combine the neem oil with sal suds, which is a really powerful organic soap. Uh, we do that because oil doesn't mix with water when you're using just the neem oil. Uh, so you mix it together and it creates a really effective pest control. The neem oil works separately from the soap. You know, you hear about people using soap solutions and insecticidal soap. So the soap acts as kind of an insecticide too. This combination here works so well for aphids, most of the creepy crawlies in the garden other than caterpillars and worms. And the neem oil also is a very powerful fungicide. So not only does it help with bugs, but it does to some extent also help with things like powdery mildew and blight. Not always as effective as we would like, but if you catch things early, the neem oil does seem to help those uh, funguses a, a little bit in the garden. Now, two years ago, we were starting to have a problem with uh, funguses on our cucumber plants. We noticed it really early on and we created a neem oil soap spray and sprayed down all of the cucumber plants and like that it helped. So the neem oil is a powerful fungicide. Right, yeah, I think it depends what's going on because sure. we haven't found that it helps a real lot with the uh, like blight on the tomatoes. Right. Uh, but yeah, that one year it was crazy. Like overnight it turned our cucumber plants around and, and cured whatever was going on with them. So the ratio that you use for this combination is one tablespoon of the sal suds and one tablespoon of the neem oil per gallon of water. Now, like I said, this is a very general thing we spray, but there are some problems in the garden that need something more specific. The main problem that we have in our garden is different types of caterpillars and worms. So there's something that we use for that that we have found to be very effective. Now what we use for controlling caterpillars and worms in the garden is BT. There's a lot of different brands. Uh, to be honest, I don't ever really pick a certain brand to order. Uh, this is what was available on Amazon this year when I got ready to order. And so this is what we got this year. This is Summit brand. I think Monterey is another brand that we've used in the past. But I don't think it really the brand really matters a whole lot. Go by price and what you can get available. If you can find it locally, that's probably even better. So what BT is, is a bacteria. It's a bacteria that specifically kills worms and caterpillars. Basically, you spray this on your plants in the evening. Uh, it breaks down pretty easily in sunlight, so you want to always spray in the evening. And then when those caterpillars start to eat your leaves and things at night, they eat some of the BT and that bacteria gets inside of them and pretty much like dissolves their stomach. So they stop eating your plants and over time they die. It's not an instant kill. You won't suddenly come out the next morning and see a bunch of dead caterpillars. Uh, it takes about three or four days, I think, before it really starts to kill them off. But it almost immediately gives them like an upset stomach, so they want to stop eating your plants. Now we have a big problem, like a lot of you do, with tomato hornworms, but we also have a big problem with armyworms. And they will actually get inside of our tomatoes and eat them from the inside out and almost devastate our tomato crop. Right. And that is why we really turned to this BT product was for our tomatoes. They also get into our peppers. The tomato hornworms, you can go out with a black light and pick them off and do a pretty good job, but these army worms were just killing us. Now this we also put in a tank sprayer and it's one tablespoon per gallon. Now one thing you do want to make sure you do with this is shake it up really well before you use it because it can settle. And you also want to throw away any that you haven't used at the end of the season and buy fresh every year. Because it's a live bacteria, uh, once it's opened, it's good for one season, but you really want to toss it and get new each season, even if you haven't used it all. And this is an OMRI approved uh, product, 
For those of you who don't know, Omri is a, an organization that certifies things for organic use. So anytime you see something, and they'll usually say right on it, Omri listed, that means it's approved for organic gardening. That's the best tool that we have to go off of. I know there is some controversy over BT, and a lot of people don't want to use it, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, if it's approved for organic gardening and you're not using more than you absolutely have to, uh, it's a safe product and I feel comfortable spraying this and then using that food for our family. Now the two main problems that we have with our tomatoes is the worms and blight, which is a fungus. And so we have found a fungicide that is also OMRI approved that works pretty well for it. Now the one that we use is called copper octanate or octanoate or something like that. Uh, but. Uh, it is approved for organic gardening, so you want to do your research and make sure you get one. Now, this is one thing that we do on a pretty regular schedule once we start to see disease on the plants. Because really, none of these products, none of, none of the things for like the funguses and stuff are going to knock it out 100%. What you're really trying to do is slow it down so that you can still have a productive year. And eventually though, most of these things are gonna take over your garden, uh, but what you're trying to do is get it through until fall when the garden should be done anyway. So the copper fungicide, we spray that about every two weeks. And we spray this mainly just on our tomatoes, although occasionally we'll spray it on the cucumber plants as well. Now, one thing we haven't talked about are those darn squash bugs. Squash bugs and cucumber beetles are awful, they're terrible, and we haven't found a fantastic solution for them. We've talked about them in lots of videos in the past, and we've had a lot of suggestions. And about, we've tried most of your yeah, suggestions. Uh, about how to control them. For instance, uh, diatomaceous earth sprinkling it on there. Uh, we have tried that, and it didn't knock them back at all. No. The thing about DE or diatomaceous earth, earth is that as soon as it gets wet, whether that's by rain or by dew, it's completely ineffective. We get a lot of rain here in the Ozarks and we also have really heavy dew in the morning. Right. So and, would, we, and we run our drip system. Right, so it would basically be an everyday thing that we would need to do, sprinkle DE on all of our plants. We've also tried some organic products like pyrethrum, uh, which is a spray that also just doesn't seem to really be very effective against the squash bugs, at least not where we live. I don't know if ours are just like super bugs or what, but they just don't seem phased even by uh, some of the sprays. A lot of people have a lot of success hand picking off the squash bugs or uh, taking off their eggs from each of the leaves. And while we'd really like to be able to do that, and we have so many other things going on in the garden that that's just not something that we're able to do. So really at this time, our best defense against squash bugs and cucumber beetles is to just not grow the things that attract them the most. Right. So if you guys know uh, something that really works. For real. <laughs> <laughs> like you've actually done it and it has worked for you. We would love to hear about it. Uh, like I said, we've tried most of the suggestions that you guys have already given us and we just haven't found them to be effective in our area. Now it may just be that we have such a big population of the squash bugs here that there's just not going to be a real uh, thing that works to get them all gone. So we may just have to, you know, continue doing what we're doing now, which is just not grow those things. So at the end of the day, having a good garden is a lot of work. There's no way around it, whether you're using the weed fabric to keep down the weeds, at least that's one chore you don't have to do, but there's still a lot of other things that you have to do to have a productive garden. But the rewards are so amazing. The work is so worth it because you get awesome, nutritious food for your family. So you guys, we hope that you enjoyed coming along with us today to do our very first tomato harvest of this year and sitting down with us and talking to you about the things that are working for us to control the bugs and to fertilize and make a beautiful garden. We'd love to hear what's working for you guys as well. Leave those in the comments below. Tell us what part of the country you're in as well because those comments help other people who are watching the videos as well and they may be watching from somewhere near you. Right, you guys, make sure that you hit the subscribe button below so that you're notified of when we put out new videos and the best thing that you can do to help us here on the homestead is to share our videos. Until next time, thanks so much for stopping by our homestead. Take care and God bless. God bless.